a lot of the um, issues and things that are going on around social justice and some of these movements, I've been talking a lot about this recently, very controversial topic, but I think it is necessary for God's remnant church to look at these issues. Um, I think I'm going to be able to do both of the topic. I'll cover everything for the two seminars I was going to do today. And actually, this later today, I want to do one on music. Um, and, you know, some of the things about music that are really relevant for us in the end times. So please pray for me. We're going to jump right in and get started. Um, Genesis chapter 3. Actually, our first verse will actually be 1 Samuel 15, 22. Behold, to obey is better than to sacrifice, and to hearken than the fat of rams. For rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft, and stubbornness is as iniquity and idolatry. So our message for this first uh, seminar, my first seminar of the day here, is under the spell of revolution. Under the spell of revolution. Uh, let's pray. Father God, we thank you for this opportunity to study your word and to look at end time issues, Lord. These are difficult and challenging issues, Lord. So we are asking for an extra portion of your Holy Spirit. Um, and Lord, we just pray that you open our hearts and minds to truth so that, Lord, we might be effective in doing your work in these last days. This is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. So we're going to go to Genesis chapter 3 and just do a little recount of, in my opinion, where a lot of the last day deception obviously originates and talk a lot about why this is so relevant. Genesis 3, 1 says, Now the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said unto the woman, Yea, hath God said, You shall not eat of every tree of the garden. And the woman said unto the serpent, We may eat of the, tree of the fruit of the trees of the garden, but of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God hath said, You shall not eat of it, Neither shall ye touch it, lest ye die. And right away, you see the first step in Satan's deception. The first step is actually to question God's word. The foundation of the fall is in verse 2. Uh, sorry, in verse 1, where Satan says, Hath God said? He questions what God has said. By questioning God's word, who does Satan actually question? Well, he questions Jesus. Because John 1.1 1, 1 says, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. If God said it, in essence, it's Christ himself who's being questioned. Here it is that you see the great controversy in the very beginning of the Bible. Now, verse 4, and the serpent said unto the woman, you shall not surely die. The first lie, and this is, upon this lie is all spiritualism based, and so much we could talk about with spiritualism, but this, we'll, we'll, we'll hold it here, that it is the idea that when you die, you don't really die, that allows spiritualism to happen. And I can tell you from, you know, my parents are Jamaican and I've traveled all over the world, this is a recurring theme in all the world. And unique to not believing in an immediate life after death is Bible-based Christianity. It's unique in the world. Some believe you're reincarnated and come back. Some believe you go straight to heaven, hell. Some say you go to purgatory first, pay off some debt. But the Bible teaches something very different. Verse 5, Satan takes the lie even further. For God doth know that in the day ye eat thereof, then your eyes shall be open and ye shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. Now there's an unwritten thing in this statement that you have to get for the rest of this talk to make sense. In essence, what Satan is saying is that God is trying to keep something from you. Do you see that? God is trying to keep something from you. There's more that you could have than you've already been given. And remember, they are in a perfect world. There's not a thorn on a rose bush, not a lion attacking an impala. The world is perfect. And yet, Satan says, even though God has given you all of this, he's holding back from you. And if you ate the fruit, you'd get the rest of it. And it basically is, God is not fair. You are the victims of God's oppression. You're a victim of God's um, deception. It's, it's not all that it seems to be. And, and, and basically, you can't trust God to do what's best for you. Because he knows that the day you eat of it, your eyes will be opened. And here's the promise Satan gives them, gives Eve. 
ye shall be as gods. The Hebrew there actually doesn't say you shall be as gods. It says you shall be God. Satan tells them what Isaiah 14 and Ezekiel 28 tell us he actually wanted, which was to be God. And we're going to talk about Luciferianism in modern culture in the next seminar. Um, and so in pop culture in the next seminar. But this is Lucifer's cry. You'll be as gods, knowing good and evil. Right now, all you know is this perfect world. Maybe he translates that to good, but guess what? There's a whole dark side. There's another side that you have not seen that you want to see. Now, verse 6, And when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, appetite, and it was pleasant to the eyes, it was dazzling, and a tree to be desired to make one wise, self, um, 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 uh, aggrandizement, self, you know, selfishness, pride here. She took the fruit thereof, she ate it, and once she ate it, she was deceived. But she did not want to be in the boat by herself, so what did she do? She gives it to her husband to eat with her. Was Adam deceived? He was not. Adam actually knew exactly what was happening. He was not deceived. But his, 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 either his love for Eve, some say it was his love for Eve, others say it was just the, 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 you know, his, his maybe lack of spine, but he went along with it. In verse 7, the eyes of both of them were opened. So part of what the serpent, Lucifer, says is true. And they knew that they were naked and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves aprons. Their eyes became open and what did they immediately know? That they were naked. Isn't that interesting? They became, their eyes were open and what actually, <laughs> the first realization they have isn't some amazing other worldly type things. It's that they are now inadequate. Isn't that deep? That's what Satan opened their eyes to. That when you violate God's law, what you expose is your own nakedness, your own incomplete state. Verse 7, and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves aprons. So they tried to fix themselves. That's self-righteousness that carries out to this day. It's righteousness by works, uh, which fails. Verse 8, and they heard the voice of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day, and Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God amongst the trees of the garden. Verse 9, And the Lord God called unto Adam and said unto him, Where are you? This is the question God has been asking since the fall of man. Where are you? Not where is everybody else. Where are you? And of course, the story goes on. God actually has to kill an animal, kill animals because he dresses them not in an apron, which covers from like the waist down. He covers them in a coat, which covers you from your neck down. He covers their nakedness completely. And anytime something sins, what is the wages of sin? So something had to die, right? So Adam and Eve could have died, but instead something else died. And in this is, lays the foundation for the, whole, for, the, for the understanding of the entire plan of salvation, because by Genesis 3.15 is where a greater promise comes in that, in fact, um, you're going to have a seed, Eve, and it shall bruise the head of the serpent, but the serpent's going to bite his heel. And so this promise of a coming victory over this deception is given. Paul says in 2 Corinthians chapter 11 and verse 3, But I fear... Lest by any means, as the serpent beguiled Eve, so he gives us a last day warning, through his subtility, so your mind should be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. It was a simple task to not eat of one of the trees. Wasn't that a simple test? Some people say, what kind of test was that? Why wasn't the test more elaborate? Because it, God doesn't need, it, the, even, the, even what we deal with isn't actually that, that difficult of a test if you remember the simplicity that is in Christ. Verse 4, for if he that comes preaches another Jesus whom we have not preached, or if you receive another spirit which, you, which we have, ye have not received, or another gospel which ye have not accepted, ye might well, might well bear with him. In other words, listen, there's a simplicity in Christ. Do not be deceived if someone comes with a different Jesus or a dis different gospel or a different platform to try and fix this world. And ultimately, what a lot of our young people especially, this is the kind of the way I see it. It's like an, almost like an equation. They say things are not fear. 
It's not fear. So we got to fix what's not fear. And there's actual truth to that. There's, there's, there's validity in that. But unfortunately, without God, it goes from no fear, F-A-I-R, to no fear, F-A-E-F-E-A-R. And then there's this fear that takes over, and that fear is incompatible with faith. So you move from, oh, this is, this is not right what's happening, to a fear of things that leads to an abandonment of faith or replacement with another Christ or another gospel, as Paul warns about in 2 Corinthians. So Satan uses what is not fear to create fear and destroy faith. That's what he does. And so people don't get it, and they forget that who their real enemy is. We wrestle not against flesh and blood. So yes, man is unkind to man. But what happens is we start to think man is our actual enemy. Once you believe humans are your enemy, you're in trouble. Because you don't understand, you'll, you'll miss out on the whole span of the great controversy. And so Satan will use the fact that people are abused and mistreated to stand in front of you like the apple and say, listen, you can't trust God. Look at the suffering in the world. And I'm going to show you that they, inherently there's only one religion blamed for all of the ills of the world. Christianity. It is a powerful thing, and I, I, maybe I'll get time to get into it. And let me say this. I, 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 I was raised in Connecticut, where we live now, and 10th grade I moved to Miami, and I can't give too much of the testimony here. I'm going to do that in the second set, but I'll do this short so we can deal with music in the second one. Um, and when we moved to Miami, I went to a school where there were, was a whole, the school is about 40% Jewish. They bust us black kids in from the southern part of Dade County, closer to Perrine area. So a bunch of us were bust up. Our side, you know, there was one neighborhood that was more West Indian, one was more black American, but all of us got bust up together. And I'm telling you, when I went to school, the first day I went to class, um, I went into the bathroom and on the wall, it said N-words, go back to Africa. There was a, a picture of an ape with a noose around its neck hanging on the wall, like uh, drawn on the wall. I, coming from Connecticut, all I could think is, man, who in the world had enough time to go up there and draw all of this stuff on the wall? I was like, no, I did that in Connecticut. Um, and that was the, t that, the next two and a half years until I graduated high school. And I graduated high school with Katanji Brown Jackson. Some of you may re recognize that name. She's the current, the latest addition to the U.S. Supreme Court. She's in my yearbook. We marched together out of high school. Very brilliant young lady. Uh, I have to say, very brilliant young lady. She was brilliant when we were in high school. Um, and um, so I, I, and I'll, I'll cut the story short to tell you, it, I don't like using the word radicalize me, but I will tell you, I became very angry. I, I, I was called the N-word so much in high school that if I had $5 for every time I got called that name or heard it, I would have been able to pay for college cash if I just got $5. It was that bad. I have experienced racism. I've, my mother was a hospital administrator, and there were three known Klansmen in Homestead, Florida at the time on the board of the hospital. I, I, I've seen things. I've experienced things. And it hardened me and moved me to a place of rebellion against not just this white system that I thought was so evil, but inherently it moved me against God. And I had to be sensitive. If I have time at the end, I'll tell you the story how I came out of it. If you, if you listen to my sermon, you probably already heard it, but, but I'll tell you. And I want to submit to you that this is why I come up with this statement, right? Once you realize life is not fear, if the devil puts fear in you, you lose your faith. And that's what happened to me. I was raised Adventist. Praise God I was raised in a, knowing doctrine so well I could never veer but so far. Because what ultimately happens is that spiritualism comes into these social justice movements. And this is what started to happen to me. And I'm about to show you, take you on a journey to show you how this works and what the devil is doing with it in these last days, right? So one of the things that happens, we'll talk more about this in the next session, is that reality is often exaggerated by the media, right? So we, 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 uh, you know, I grew up in Connecticut. The Bronx isn't that far from where I grew up, where hip-hop music, rap music started. Um, and what you found is the groups like Karis, one came out with a, an album, Criminal Minded, which started a gangster rap culture. And what happened is people say, well, we're just reflecting what's happening in our neighborhood. But you're not really just reflecting what's happening in your neighborhood. When you talk about killing, shooting, selling drugs, slapping women, uh, pimping women, all this kind of stuff, you don't just, you're not just reflecting what happens in your neighborhood. You're promoting it. 
You're, 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 you're glorifying it. And it creates a moral decline. The media has the power to do that. And initially, rap was not about that. But somebody, some executives in the record industry somewhere realized, listen, if it's more gory, violent, sexual, sexist, it'll sell more. And that's what a music just has devolved continually. But of course, who runs the music industry? We'll find out next lecture. But you probably already get an idea. It's the same guy who was trying to get Eve to eat the fruit. The one that was made a, 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 a musical instrument. Now, so I'm going to show you. One of the, one of the, and so the devil, now once I was open and vulnerable, the devil came at me a lot of ways. One of them being Jamaican was Rastafarianism. Some of you have heard of Rastafarianism. They just came out, meant to put up a slide, they just came out with a, a, a biopic on the life of Bob Marley. I used to stay at his house. Um, I, knew, I sat with his mother and talked. I knew his siblings well, still do. Some of his kids. And I would be at the house and it was very, you know, very interesting listening to their, their take on the Bible. Rastafarians, like many of the movements of these last days, are going to use scripture. The black Hebrew Israelites do it. The nation of Islam, Farrakhan does it. The Rastafarians do it. If our Adventist children don't know the Bible, it's very easy to be deceived because these guys are trying to take the Bible to prove that Haile Selassie, former emperor of, the, of Ethiopia, is Jesus Christ come back to earth uh, in his kingly char character. That's literally what they say. Christ in his kingly char character. That's who Haile Selassie was. Of course, Haile Selassie died in like a coup. Communists took over Ethiopia for a little while. And if I had time, I'd talk about the history of Ethiopia and the, and the book, The Great Controversy. And Ellen White talks about Central Africa being where the Sabbath was, was, um, was kept during the Dark Ages in Europe. So in Africa, Christians were still keeping the Sabbath, which tells you that when they told, tell you the lie they told me when I was a kid, they told me to lie, Christianity is a white man's religion. That's not true. The great controversy, Ellen White makes it clear that while Europe was in the Dark Ages, true Christianity was being practiced. She mentioned the Sabbath in two places, Central Africa and Armenia. And to this day, those are the two oldest churches in the world. Did you know that? This great controversy spot on. So there's a lie that's told to black Americans Especially that says, well, Christianity is a white man's religion. You should leave it alone. Simply not a true statement historically, theologically, or in any way, right? So they exaggerate. So I'll give you an example of what, how music affects us. We'll talk more about this in the next session. This is Bob Marley and the Whalers' early career. Um, this is the, actually, he wasn't even Bob Marley and the Whalers yet. This is just the Whalers. And their album was Burning. And this is part of this biopic that just came out. Some of these songs are probably being played. But I want you to read the lyrics and how it is the devil tries to disindoctrinate you from what your parents taught you, in my case, and in the case of many young uh, uh, black people around the world. The song is called Get Up, Stand Up. Stand up for your right. Get up, stand up. Don't give up the fight. Look at what he says. Preacher man, don't tell me. Heaven is under the earth. I know you don't know what life is really worth. In other words, don't tell me that I'm going to die and go to heaven. He said, all that glitters is gold. Half the story has never been told. So now you see the light. Stand up for your light. Right. Most people think, this is the next verse, great God will come from the sky, take away everything, and make everybody feel high. But if you know what life is worth, you would look for yours on earth, and now you see, a lot, see the light, you stand up for your right. And they say Ja, which is the name they give to Haley Selassie from out of the book of Psalms. Uh, he said, all that glitters gold, half the story is never told. Let me go to the last one. He says, this is Peter Tosh actually sings this verse in the original. We're sick and tired of your ism schism game. Dying and going to heaven in Jesus' name. Lord, we know and we understand Almighty God is a living man. Who? Haley Selassie. When Haley Selassie visited, Haley Selassie was a member of the Ethiopian Orthodox Church. When he went, that same church Ellen White was talking about, when he went to Jamaica, he told them, I am not God, do not worship me, through a translator, an interpreter. Right? And so he, the interpreter said, he's, he's not God, da 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 Rita Marley, the wife of Bob Marley, says that when she saw Haley Selassie on the stoops of the plane in the airport talking to this mob, vast mob, they say Haley Selassie was frightened when he looked out and saw the vast mobs of people trying to worship him, and he said he wasn't God. Rita Marley, Bob Marley's wife, says when he raised his hand, she could see the nail prints in his hands. Now, if you, you, you can actually go watch the video for yourself on YouTube. It still exists. There's clearly no nail prints in the man's hand. This was the emperor of Ethiopia. He had pet lions. 
He fed him with meat. Like, you know, I mean, this guy was not doing hard labor at any time in his life. But they, she believed that. Now, Rastafarians also promote the use of marijuana. That can sometimes make you see things you're not supposed to. But clearly, there's no nail in his, prints in his hand. But that's what, the, that's what it can do. Until then, it came to hip hop. Public Enemy began to promote um, black radicalism. This is one of my favorite groups. I've actually been on stage with this group before. Chuck D and Flavor Flav, relatively fa famous group. Um, actually, very famous group. Multiple platinum albums. Teaching the same thing. An undercurrent of not directly anti-Christian, but very pro-Farrakhan, which is where, obviously, if you, once you point people to Farrakhan, he's going to point you very far away from G, the Jesus of the Bible. Hip-hop music, we'll talk more about music again in the next session, but hip-hop music itself, this is, it was started by a group out of New York called the 5% Nation of Islam. They believe that only 5% of, 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 the, of black people really understood the truth, and they had it, and so great big stars like Jay-Z, Rakim, um, uh, Wu-Tang Clan, I could name more, all these people are five percenters. And let me tell you what the 5% Nation of Islam, one of their fundamental beliefs is. It is that the black man is God and the white man is the devil. And this is the basis for all, for, I should say all, but much of rap music. So when you sit and listen to the music, you don't realize at the core of the music is this doctrine. Jay-Z has it, that's why they call Jay-Z Hova. People don't know why, because he was short for Jehovah. That's what he called himself. He says, so in his, in, he has a lyric where he says, I am Jehovah God MC. So now you're listening to a man who's telling you he is God. Should you be listening to a man telling you he is God? This is what, especially the young people are exposed to. And then I'm gonna come back to Farrakhan, hopefully I have time. But the Nation of Islam, this is one of the greatest mouthpieces of hatred and racism in the country. Now, again, let me make it clear, as a black person in America, I have experienced racism. I know exactly what it looks like. And because I am a believer in Jesus Christ, I also understand racism is contagious. It spreads, and anyone can be racist. There are people who say, well, you know, if you're black, you can't be a racist because you don't have power. And get, but that is a satanic lie because it gives you the opportunity to hate people and think you will not be held responsible for it. Hatred is hatred. And it doesn't matter in which direction it goes. The power of the civil rights movement in the United States was that it actually loved the very people who oppressed them. Just go back and watch a documentary on the civil rights movement. You will be, you will be, you will be driven to tears. I don't care who you are. If you're a Christian, you'll be driven to tears when you think about the sacrifices that were made in the name of love. Love for this country. It was the Constitution that Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. quoted and referenced every time he demanded rights. He made a, that movement, a church-born Christian movement, called America on the table to be what she's supposed to be, based on our own documents. The church, those days are gone. It's a different world now. America responded well in the 60s, all things considered. Lyndon Johnson was from this state. He wasn't really a big fan of black people, if you know your history. But he signed into law uh, two documents, the Voters' Rights Act and the Civil Rights Act, that have changed the face of America. Despite himself. That's the power of the documents. This is why the Seventh-day Adventist Church was raised up in the United States of America. Because you needed those doctrines for the remnant church to be safe to grow up. If I had time, I'd talk about Ellen White. People say Ellen White was a racist because they take some obscure statements. Ellen White sent her own white northern son into the deep south down the Mississippi River to help raise up black congregations. If you have any idea how dangerous that would have been post-Civil War, you don't know American history. The university I graduated from, Oakwood University, was started by her son. I mean, no racist in their right mind would have sent their child from Michigan to Alabama to do that in, 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 just after the Civil War. Adventism is the only Protestant, only denomination, the Catholic Church, whether you call it a denomination or not, is not innocent either. Only Adventism from its inception was abolitionist. Never did the Seventh-day Adventist Church make a statement in support of slavery. Every statement was against slavery. 
So we have a great legacy that we have to live up to because one of the signs of the remnant church isn't simply that we know truth, but Jesus gave it to us. He says, by this, men will know that you are my disciples. What is it? That you have love one for another. We have a challenge. We still have separated conferences by race. And people don't want to talk about it. But at some point, somebody's going to have to stand up and say, enough is enough. We're going to be one church. And I know that's tough in the climate we're in, but it's going to take some strength in order for the church to move into a position to do what she needs to do to end this work. Matthew 5 and verse 43 says, You have heard that it hath been said, Thou shalt love thy neighbor and hate thine enemy. This, these are the texts that help me regain my sanity after all the things I experienced. Verse 44, But I say unto you, love your enemies. Bless them that curse you. Do good to them that hate you. And pray for them which despitefully use you and persecute you. That you may be the children of your Father which is in heaven. For he makes the sun to rise on the evil and on the good. And sends rain on the just and on the unjust. We treat people kindly because we're Christians. Despite who they are or what they do to us. And that's a difficult thing for a lot of Christians. White, black or other. But that's the commission given us by Christ. Even your enemies. You're not looking to wipe whole nations off the face of the earth. You're not hoping for the demise of people. You're hoping that they come to know Jesus Christ and be saved. Education 228. Listen to what Ellen White says, and we're going to get into some, some real current event stuff here in a second. Education 228. At the same time, anarchy is seeking to sweep away all law. I'm going to show you that here in a second. Not only divine, but what? Human. There's a movement to wipe away all law. Listen, this is prophecy because it's, this is happening right now. The centralizing of wealth and power, the vast combinations for the enriching of the few at the expense of the many, the combinations of the poorer classes for the defense of their interests and, claim, and claims, the spirit of unrest, of riot and bloodshed, the worldwide dissemination of, of the same teachings that led to the French Revolution, all are tending to involve the whole world in a struggle similar to that which convulsed France. And I have a whole thing I do on the French Revolution and how it mirrors what's happening in the world today. Now, I want you to look at this. Notice that she's actually describing all sides, in my opinion, of the current political spectrum. She shows the filthy rich. She shows those who would want to defund the police, right? Some say they're seeking a way to sweep away all law, not only divine, but human, right? Um, centralizing wealth and power. That's the one percent everybody rails against. Satan is orchestrating all of these things. From, from the riots after, the, after, the, after George Floyd was killed, all the way to the, to, the, to the monopolizing of money and the exorbitant wealth of the very few, all of it is, is a part of Satan's design. It allows him to hold up a fruit today and say, something's being withheld from you. Education 228, Ellen White, just finishing that statement, she says this, such are the influences to be met by the youth of today. To stand amidst such upheavals they are now to lay the foundations of character. I talked about character last night. We'll talk more about it as the weekend goes on. Let me tell you something. There has never been a time more difficult to be a young person than today. The deceptions are profound. I mean, the work the devil is putting in, I said it last night. He's angry because he knows he has a short time. He's furious about that. And hence, what he's unleashed on our young people is beyond anything the world has ever seen. So, so here's a good one. This article, the, Stan, the Stanford Freedom Project, a Christian movement, the civil rights, uh, civil rights in America, just to kind of support what I was saying earlier. This was a movement where they sang hymns and prayed even for their enemies. It was a, a very different movement than what we see today. This is a book by Barbara uh, F. Walter, um, very well-written book. Um, uh, she, she leans politically left, but the book is powerful, How Civil Wars Start. She talks about how in order to start a civil war, you have to fractionalize the people into small groups and turn them one against the other. 
I believe that's happening in America. And she, she's not writing this from the perspective of like a, a right-wing evangelical Christian. She's writing it from the, more of a left position, but it's because it is an observation you can't really get around. The country is being fractioned up into pieces and you're turning people against themselves, right? But what that's led to is a new generation of activists. And you can see on this young lady's shirt, it says, this ain't your mama's civil rights movement. Something different. The civil rights movement was Christian. What we have now is not that. It is absolutely something different. And so one of the things I say is that if there's no God, there's no purpose. I talked about that yesterday. And so the APA, the American Psychological Association, purpose in life, ikagia, this is the Japanese term, a frontal lobe function, we'll talk more about the frontal lobe later, is a natural and mental, mentally healthy way to cope with stress. If you do not have true purpose, you will not manage stress well. When you rip God out of society and out of the hearts of people, one of the things that follows it is true purpose. And when you don't have true purpose, it's difficult to deal with the trials of life. It's part of the reason you hear young people really needing, you know, you know they're, they're emotionally, they, they, I mean, from their own mouths, need safe space. They want trigger warnings. They want these things because they've been, you have to insulate them. Purpose makes you resilient. Purpose makes you strong. So what's happening? Well, I show this slide a lot. This is a book, Revolutionary Witchcraft, A Guide to Magical Activism, A Fiery Inclusive Guide for Activists and Witches Alike. Revolutionary Witchcraft is an empowered introduction to the history and practice of politically motivated magic. Did you know that when these elections happen, there are people actually casting spells so that they, it comes out the way they want it to? Did you know that? Do you know that everything is spiritual warfare, even though Satan is orchestrating it? I mean, that's, you can read, I, I would say don't read the book, but that's a description of the book. Please don't read the book. The Atlantic had a journal a article years ago. This is from March of 2020. Why witchcraft is on the rise. Americans' interest in spell casting tends to wax as instability rises and trust in establishment ideas plummets. So as they question the patriarchy, Western civilization, Christianity, the government, as you question those things, what sweeps in behind it? Spiritualism. Because what's actually happening? It is the devil holding the fruit again, saying, God's withheld something from you. There's more that you're not seeing or getting. Witchcraft Activism, there's another uh, book. This is, uh, cut the thing from Amazon. A Toolkit for Magical Resistance. Include spells for social justice, civil rights, the environment, and more. The first hand, hands-on guide to witchcraft activism with practical tips on everything from joining activist groups to conjuring spells for self-protection. And so you can see they only got three and a half, three and a quarter stars, so clearly their spells don't work as good as some other ones, I guess. But um, <laughs> I have a rule. I don't buy anything if it doesn't have more than four stars. So I wouldn't buy this book, but... Clearly not that good. All right. One of the places that have been most under attack is the black church in America. I was at a high, I used to, uh, you heard my, me introduce last night, I, I sat on committees for the Centers for Disease Control and for um, presidents of the United States. Um, and in one meeting, I was with a former Surgeon General of the United States, um, and we were dealing with some things, and I heard an activist say to um, one of the guys that was with the organization the surgeon, former Surgeon General was with, he said, we have to destroy the black church. And I was in earshot. He said, we have to destroy them because they're still preaching those old time, and I don't remember the word to use, but I'll throw in the word truths. We have to destroy the black church, they said. Now, this is a picture, I wish I had, I should have put the whole article up, of black women who have left Christianity and I'm going to show you how popular music is moving this. And now they're into West African religions and into ancestor worship. And one of the ways they did it was um, shows like the Black Panther uh, and Wakanda forever. And the surprising religious backstory of Black Panther's Wakanda, right? So they introduce, uh, uh, the, in, order, in other words, they're going to erase the existence of Christianity in Africa, replace it with... Um, the animist um, and, and ancestral worship and 
even voodoo of, of, of West Africa as the way that black people should worship. Not, again, realizing, and a good friend of mine, Yankston Sednak, I think he's from Ghanaian. I went to Oakwood with him. He's a pastor in Northeastern Conference now. He has a great book called um, Knowledge of the Creator, God Embedded in African Culture. And he goes throughout Africa and shows you that there was a time when much of Africa actually knew Bible truths. They had to have for some of those things to be left in their tra traditions and cultures all over the continent. So it's a lie that you believe, well, they, they, they didn't have the truth. They actually had the truth in Africa. And the great controversy supports it, and the Bi more importantly, the Bible supports it. The Ethiopian eunuch went back to Africa. Simon of Cyrene was from Africa. So there's a lie that somehow Africa was devoid of Christ or Christianity, just not true. And where this has really come to a head is probably to the Black Lives Matter and spiritualism. And let me say, the term Black Lives Matter to me makes sense. Black lives do matter. I like that. It does matter. But again, the fruit works best if you mix truth with error. So black lives do matter. You know, there, there, are, there are a lot of problems, a lot of uh, inequities in this country. I would be lying if I stood here and told you that all is well. There's a lot of work to be done. But Satan capitalizes on the idea of that things are not F-A-I-R fair. Remember that. He uses that to his advantage. And this is one of those cases. So this is from USC's Dornsif. Um, I think I may have put, I don't know if I put the author's, name, author's names in here, but Black Lives Matter says, far from being anti-religious, Faith and spirituality run deep in Black Lives Matter. Black Lives Matter affiliated organizations utilize spiritual tools, listen to this, such as meditation, Reiki, which I was explained once, this is Japanese witchcraft, I know somebody who practiced it, acupuncture, plant medicine, chanting and prayer, along with other African and indigenous spiritualities to connect and care for those directly impacted by state violence and white supremacy. The history of white supremacy often enacted within institutional Christianity. See how they, what they do? So the enemy is Christianity, which, again, is not a true statement. In fact, if I was to go deep, I'd show you that Revelation the first beast of Revelation, Revelation 13 was the organization that actually carried this out. I have an amazing book on it I'm reading, and it's not what people think. Has often vilified and, Christ and criminalized indigenous and African beliefs, promoted the idea that black people are divinely destined to servitude and subjected communities to forced conversions. And so they say, listen, Christianity is evil inherently, you know, give up on Christianity. And so you're mad that there's been a police killing. Your emotions are riled up. Again, I've experienced this myself. Someone shows you this, and guess what? You just, you just connect to it. It, it. it can even circumvent logic and reasoning because emotionally you're so angry at what just happened. I, I didn't put it into this talk, but this is why they chose Barabbas. They were tired of the Roman oppression. They were tired of the way the Roman soldiers treated them. They were tired of being under the Roman yoke. And when they looked over at Jesus standing next to Pilate, beaten, emaciated, weak, and they looked over at Barabbas, strong, murderer, thief, rebel rouser, they said, you know what? We want freedom now. Give us Barabbas. We can't wait for the pie in the sky stuff this Jesus is talking about. He said his kingdom is not of this world. Give us Barabbas. And church, this is what young people are crying for now. They don't even realize it. They're saying, give us Barabbas. Because what we actually want is freedom now. We're not concerned with eternity. So this is one of the founders of Black Lives Matter says, we do have an ideological frame, myself and Alicia. In particular, our trained organizers, we are trained Marxists. So I just, I, I mentioned this, that Netflix documentary on the atomic bomb and, 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 and the Soviet Union. It's brilliant and great history lessons. And so if you look up Karl Marx, you find out some interesting things. It wasn't actually his, even his real name, Marx. Religion, he says, is the opium of the people. It is the sigh of the oppressed creature, the heart of a heartless world, and the soul of our soulless conditions. In other words, religion is really just something that you need as a crutch. It's opium for the people, right? But there's a book, Karl Marx and the Satanic Roots of Communism, because I'm hearing more and more Adventist Christians say, I'm a, I'm a socialist, I'm a, I'm a democratic socialist, they don't realize to say that is to say you're a communist. They're like, I'm not a communist, I'm a socialist. Same thing. You're a communist, right? 
Here's what he said. This is from some of his poems. So let's, what is, if you're a trained Marxist, what did Karl Marx actually believe religiously? He tells you he doesn't believe in religion. He's an atheist. But here's one of his poems. This one is called The Pale Maiden. Thus heaven I've forfeited. I know it full well. My soul, once true to God, is chosen for hell. Now, Karl Marx once studied to be a Christian minister, if you, I believe you look it up. At least he was in a, a, you know, a Protestant Christian church at one time. Even though I do think ethnically he was Jewish, he was in a Christian church. Here's one from his poem, Human Pride. Let's see who Marx actually is. With, dis- with disdain, I will throw my gauntlet full in the face of the world and see the collapse of this pygmy giant. Who is the pygmy giant? He's calling Jehovah God a pygmy giant whose fall will not stifle my ardor. Then will I wander godlike and victorious through the ruins of the world, and giving my words an active force, I will feel equal to the creator. You know whose words those are? Lucifer's. Now here's what's interesting. Lucifer's going to get exactly what he wanted. During the millennium, he's going to walk around, won't be godlike, in a ruined world. He's going to get what he's asking for one day. But Luciferianism, we'll talk more about it in the next talk, but Luciferianism teaches God is too kind, the creator is too kind, he will not actually destroy us with this world, he's going to give Satan this world, and all who are on his side will get that bliss of eternity with Satan. So, do you want to be a trained Marxist? Well, it depends on which side of the great controversy you want to be on. Ezekiel 16, 49 says it like this, Behold, this was the iniquity of your sister Sodom. Pride, fullness of bread, and abundance of idleness um, was in her and in her daughters. Neither did she strengthen the hand of the poor and needy. And they were haughty and committed abomination before me. Therefore, I took them away as I saw good. What is the sin? What is the iniquity of Sodom? Number one is pride. Isn't that interesting? Pride is a big thing today. It's black pride, Latino pride, all kinds of pride. Fullness of bread, you have too much. Just like Ellen White talked about. An abundance of idleness was in her and in her daughters. She did not help the hand of the poor and the needy. And so you see, this is what happened. So Black Lives Matter is a spiritual movement, says co-founder Patrice Cullors. Um, Abdul and Cullors touched on the practice of calling out the names of the victims um, which advocate for the protests and demonstrations. It's kind of a way to invoke their spirits, Abdullah said. Uplifting the names of victims go beyond creating hashtags. Color said, it is literally almost resurrecting a spirit so they can work through us to get the work we, that we need to get done, she said. Like resurrecting a spirit to work through us. I hope you get what that means. Because this picture I showed you first, these are pastors, clergy, put their fists in the air as Melina Abdullah, center left, co-founder of Black Lives Matter in Los Angeles, addresses the crowd. Christian pastors are involved in this when it clearly it is not the God of Christianity that is being invoked here. She says, I wasn't raised with honoring ancestors. As I got older and started to feel like I was missing something, ancestral worship became really important. She said, the woman also touched on the tradition of praying and pouring libations during demonstrations, which is a sacrifice you give to the dead or to the gods. Another article, June 9 article, the fight for Black Lives Matter is a spiritual movement. Um... And they were outside of Mayor Garcetti's home. Um, Abdullah on Saturday said it took her almost a year before she realized Black Lives Matter was more than a racial and social justice movement. At its core, it is a spiritual movement. Color said it became very clear to her that they needed spiritual protection. Um, as they were targeted by the police, the right, and the neo-Nazis, um, she said, it, she, said the, the, she wouldn't be able to do the work without spiritual practice. Uh, to try to do so, it would be antithetical, she said. So there's another article here. This is from the American Family Association, you know, American Family Radio, uh, Black Lives Matter movement driven by occult practice. Um, I think they duplicate some of the stuff in the other article. But here they talk about the pouring out of libations on the ground. Those present present chanted Ase. She clarified that the Yoruba term is often used by practitioners of Ifa, a faith and divination system that originated in West Africa, occult practices, right? it is very, a very important practice because the hashtags are, are, are um, for us as a way more than hashtags. It is literally almost resurrecting spirits. I read that in that last article. Abdullah explained that when they say the names, they invoke that spirit, and then those spirits actually become present with you. 
You remember what the first lie of the serpent said was? You shall not surely die. Here it is. So when you go in some of our own churches, and people don't like me for saying this, but somebody's got to speak the truth. What is, what is, what is a Seventh-day Adventist church doing marching in this? When they're calling down spirits of the dead to march with you. There are a lot of ways we can work to fix the breach in our society and support people who are not doing well and make up for, for injustice. Marching with spirits is not a good idea in my opinion. She says, look at what she says, maybe I'm sharing too much. The occult means that there's something hidden. Maybe I'm sharing too much. He literally says that she's sharing a bit of what she's not supposed to share. But we became very intimate with the spirits that we call on regularly. I hope you guys are getting this. Abraham Hamilton um, says this. He's from AFR's The Hamilton Corner. They, they're not doing what you think they're doing, he insisted. You think they're just honoring people. They are conjuring up spirits. And let me tell you something. There's a lot of things I do. One of them I don't mess with is spirits. I've traveled the world and preached a lot of places and seen some weird stuff happen. And I, my joke is always, my name is not Shaggy and I don't have a dog named Scooby. I stay away from all that stuff. I'm not looking to solve the mystery. I'm going in the opposite direction. So if you're talking about conjuring up spirits, you can count me out. But here's where churches have gone. We have Adventist pastors who have gone on face, uh, on, um, um, what was the thing we all used during the pandemic? On um, Zoom. I was going to say FaceTime. Zoom. Telling black church practitioners, Adventists, that they should be looking to their ancestors. Black Lives Matter site removes page on nuclear family structure amid NFL vets criticism. They have a whole criticism of the nuclear family. I, I don't think I have time to get into this. But they basically say, you know, the Western prescribed nuclear family structure should basically be disbanded. Basically, the father should come out if you ever actually read that article uh, or the statements that they made on that page. I saw it before they took it down. I wish I had a screenshot it now. Um, you know, they removed that page, what we believe, where they talked about, um, you know, removing the fathers. And let me tell you something. For, 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 for black America, something shifted. We'll talk more about it next talk. But you can see here, this is the non-marital birth rates in the United States from 1940 to 2014. If you look at blacks, the purple line, look at how much lower it was in just 1970. It was, we were all, everybody else that wasn't white was called non-white. So you can extrapolate, this is basically black Americans. In, in 1940, at the height of America's racism, black families were more intact than they are today. Did you know that? They were more intact. And you can see that as goes black America, one of the reasons why white Americans have to be concerned with how bad things go for white, black Americans, they follow, right? It was a crack, crack epidemic in the 80s and 90s that affected mostly black and brown neighborhoods that turned into an opioid epidemic that affected mostly rural white people in the 2000s and 2010s and to now. We all get affected. Satan, you think Satan cares what color you are? Satan, what matters to Satan is that God loves you. That's what, that's what Satan thinks about. He wants you to be lost so that you, you, by making you be lost, he can get a touch of revenge on God. The only way he can hurt God now is for us to be lost. He knows he can't win the war. And that's why he divides us up by race. And I can tell you, listen, all of us need to work on it. All of us need to think about how God uses us in this realm because you cannot make it into the kingdom if you hate black people and you're white. Or if you're black and you hate white, you will not make it into the kingdom. I, was talking, I, got, I, almost got, I thought I was going to get beat up the other day. I was talking to black, some black people. I said, black is a temporary idea. When you get to glory, you think you're going to be you know, worried about what color you are or where you came from? Man, a guy almost knocked me out. He was so mad at the idea that when he goes to heaven, race won't matter. He actually used that racial epithet to, to, to make, try and make his point, which only made my point even better. I said, as long as you're this angry, you're not, you, how are you going to be saved? The Bible says to be angry, but sin not. We can be angry about injustice, but it can't drive you to taking Satan's position. And you, I mean, look at the numbers. I mean, this is staggering the change. And what changed? You notice the inflection point is the 1960s. What happened in 1960s? I don't know if I'll get to talk about it much this weekend. It was a sexual revolution. What destroyed black America wasn't racism. It was 
policies and a cultural swing. The number one predictor of poverty in America is actually whether or not you're a single parent. Not, not what color you are. Black married couples do better than white single couple, a, a white single mother. Well, no one tells you that. They say black people are poor because of racism, but no one tells you that. In fact, family structure is what really matters, right? And when you look at family structure, it has drastically changed. So you look at married parents, two-parent homes, they're the ones who do the best. Even when couples cohabit and raise their children, they, oh, back in the day they say shacking up. I don't know if they say that anymore. When they cohabit, they still live in poverty. There's something about marriage itself that is protective. And yet, there, when I worked in the, in the parks in Connecticut, and I would have to go and talk to some of the kids that were misbehaving, and I'd take them to their mother's, to, the, to their apartment. I didn't know who I was going to find. I'd take them home and say, hey, miss so-and-so, your child is acting up in the park, at the park, and, you know, we, we need this behavior to change. I'd say, can I talk to you and his father? And you know how many times the mothers would say, um, his father's not here. If the social worker comes and even finds his father's shoes in my house, I will lose my benefits. Think about that for a second. We literally paid to break up poor families in this country and then perpetuate poverty forward because of it. Education. Page 228 says this. Spiritualism asserts that men are unfallen demigods, that each mind will judge itself, and that, true, that truth, knowledge, places men above all law. That is, all sins committed are innocent, for whatsoever, whatever is right is, is right. Whatever is, is right. And God does not condemn. The basis of human beings is, it, present, it represents as in heaven and highly exalted there. Thus it declares to all men, it matters not what you do, live as you please, heaven is your home. Multitudes are thus led to believe that desire is the highest law, that license is liberty, and that man is accountable only to himself. At the same time, anarchy, oh, we read that one already, that, that multitudes are thus led to believe that desire is the highest law, that license is liberty, and that man is accountable only to himself. In the last couple minutes here, I want to tell you how I got out of this thing. So, and I, I've said this in other sermons, forgive me if you've heard it before, but I think it's worth saying. I was in medical school, and Louis Farrakhan was coming to Miami, where I was in medical school. Now, I had been a part of the national Stop the Violence movement for the Nation of Islam. You know, not, no one of any significance. Maybe that was how they were trying to get me to join the nation and leave the church. I don't know. But I would go and see Farrakhan and different. I saw him in Nashville and Atlanta before that. This Sabbath afternoon, I left church and went to the Miami Arena. 8,000 people showed up to hear Louis Farrakhan speak. Let's pull up a picture of him again. Um, and I was sitting next to two very intelligent young ladies I'd known from childhood when I'd visit Florida in the summertime. And so you see on here it says Savior's Day in the name of Islam, Savior's Day. Um, and the Nation of Islam believes that, ironically, a white-looking Arab, W. Fard Muhammad, is the one who came and he's the one who saved black people. It's a very weird when you start to think about it. Um, but Farrakhan was speaking, he said, the black man is the original man. And I'd heard that all, in all the rap songs, I'd heard that before, and everybody starts clapping, I was like, yeah, whatever. The black man is the original man. Then he said, and I can prove it. I said, whoa, he's gonna prove it. Let me hear this. The man said, 66 trillion years ago. I said, trillion with a T? Not even the evolutionists go back that far. He said, 66 trillion years ago, he said, the black man blew the moon off of the earth with dynamite. I, did, I, I was sitting there, I wasn't even laughing. It wasn't funny. I was dumbfounded as 8,000 people began to applaud. I said, what is going on? He said, and I can prove it. Now I'm sitting there like, okay, now I got to hear the rest of this one. He said, when the astronauts went to the moon, they could still smell the dynamite. I was like this. 8,000 people stood to their feet and applauded. 8,000. I was slumped down in my seat. It would take a fifth grade, Miss Goldman, my fifth grade science teacher, that's all the education I needed to know that anything you smell on the moon came from the earth. Because if you smell in moon air, you're a dead astronaut. 8,000 
people applauded. Church, I want you to, I, I, you got, I mean, it sounds funny, but it's, it's not, the deception's not funny. I slumped down in my seat and that Sabbath afternoon, I repented to God. In that moment, I said, Lord, I have sinned. I have allowed my anger at what white people did to me when I was in high school to make me open to demonic deception. And I repented in my seat. I wept bitterly that day. It was as if it all flooded and came back to me because I wasn't raised like that. In Connecticut, everybody got along well. And I submit to you today, church, it is important. If you're a white Adventist Christian, it's important that you make sure you are doing right by people who are different than you. Let me, let me say that out loud, because a lot of them are looking to you to act up so they can justify their exit from this church. If you're an Af a black Adventist, you also have to ask yourself, is being black more important than being Christian? Because to me, being Christian is what matters. Because I want to make it into the king. I, listen, I've been on this earth long enough now to realize nobody can fix it. I don't care who you vote into office in November, this world is in permanent trouble. And it, that's why the Bible says the earth is going to be made new. Because there's no way on, in this broken world to get us where God wanted us to be when Eve messed up in the garden. It takes a brand new world. And guess what? That takes for us to have brand new hearts. Clean characters. The world will be made over for those who've been made over. So this is one of the things that we've got to shake. We have got to choose to live for God on this issue. We've got to stand for what's right and we've got to live it. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you for this opportunity to study your word and look at these issues. They're tough issues, Lord, but we are asking for your Holy Spirit. I ask in a special way, Lord, that you bless our church, our denomination. And Father God, we live up to one of the truths you left us to live up to, which is by this men should know that you are my disciples that you have love one for another. Let us be a church where the love of Christ is felt, not in a weak and palsy way that lowers standards, but in one that holds the standards so high that all of us shriek at the foot of the cross, knowing that at the foot of the cross, there are no big eyes or little U's. Help us, Lord, to put you first, not country, not race, Christ. And let that be how we live until you return. This is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen.